Actually, uh, I'm coming to someone who has a lot of experience and who's been uh, walking around the fields of conflict for 25 years, I think, and therefore can see many patterns and can see the repetition of, of issues and difficulties. So Humphrey Hawksley is I'm very grateful that he could come today. He's a BBC World Affairs correspondent. He, he told me, maybe a long time now, told me uh, once that his, his job meant that he would go that way when everyone else was going that way. <laughs> and there was a sense of trepidation, I'm sure, at the, at the same time. But ha after having done that for a long time in many countries, in China, Philippines, many other areas of, of the world, uh, he has a lot of experience of going to, to Congo or going to Guatemala, and particularly recently looking at supply chains and looking at standards of labor, standards of treatment of, of people. And that, this is a very important uh, value to raise the consciousness. So with that, please, let's welcome Humphrey Hawksley. Thank you. That's got a mic rattle on it, so it, if that's okay. Uh, thank you, Nathaniel. Where have you gone on your... Uh, um, there he is at the back. Um, Yes, I, drawing together all the really interesting stuff that we've heard, ending with uh, Nathaniel there, I just want to tell you a little bit what I think he's up against, but I want to start with those 17 goals because it terrifies me. Absolutely terrifies God, in all his wisdom, created 10 commandments. <laughs> and we didn't know that we would understand what they were. So when they wrote the New Testament, they boiled it down into two. And if you put the love of God as a given, the other one is love thy neighbor and thyself. In the field that we're talking about at the moment, I want to translate that into what the International Labor Organization defined after the end of the First World War. And that was essentially that lasting peace can only be accomplished if it's based on social justice. So when I hear something from Nathaniel's company there, I reckon, I don't know, but I would say that coming into you, you pay your workers well, you give them holidays, you make sure they're educated, you give them health care, and all that sort of stuff. So I want to tell you two stories that run from 2000, when these first set of goals, up until this horrific 17 goals. And you can judge for yourself the narrative of those stories. I began researching or reporting on on development around 2000. I mean, I'd done war and conflicts and all that before, but I went to the Ivory Coast in Africa, where we found by chance children being trafficked in the cocoa trade. And in London, when I got back, I rang up what I thought were respectable companies like Hershey's, Cadbury's, Mars, and all that. Firstly, they denied it was happening. They then threatened to take my job away by writing to the Director General of the BBC. And then we went back again. And we found it again. And then they said, it's not our problem. Or it's not our, it is a problem, but it's not our responsibility. The responsibility lies with the government. And the government of many of these countries, as we know, has weak institutions. They don't operate with the rule of law. And I went back to the Ivory Coast. The last time I went was in early 2011. I think. And in that time, in the fuss that was grown up with the media, who was it that told us the responsibility of the media? I mean, we kicked up a fuss about this. And laws were passed and protocols were signed and the chocolate companies promised to stop child labor and to build pilot projects and to educate the children. And each time I went going back, nothing had happened at all. And I actually had lunch with a Nestle executive at one stage and after a enough glasses of wine. I said, when you get an instruction from politicians to clear up something, what do you do? And he said, oh, well, if it comes from politicians, we generally put it in the bin. <laughs> and I worked out how it sort of works, or I put together um, an idea of how it works. What happened in the Ivory Coast in many countries, and you might actually sort of, uh, you know, relate to this, is that you had a situation where you had a corrupt government or a weak government that was relying on two things to keep it in power. One was the multinationals that were taking their raw materials, and secondly was the aid industry that was pouring money into their governments. 
It, didn't, it had a relationship with those two sectors. It had no relationship with the citizens. And therefore, some of that aid money and some of the, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, trade money could go into bolstering up the police forces and the armies in order to repress those citizens when they rose up to do something uh, that was happened. So when I see things about um, uh, we are putting money into training the security forces, well, of course, that's exactly what they want to happen. This idea that the government is responsible and the companies are not has resonated me for a long time. And I've been backwards and forwards, and I've heard the argument many times with cotton and with bricks and with conflict minerals and numerous other things. And just before Christmas, we looked into the tea industry in India. And the tea industry in India is one whereby the companies take responsibility for the workers under the Indian Plantation Act, which was passed just after independence. Uh, and therefore, there is no excuse there for there, not, for there to be a problem. But there we found, when the, or the United Nations found initially in 2007, that the tea workers of India were the most marginalized community in India. They were the least educated. They were the most malnourished. They were the most diseased. They had least opportunities for mobilization. And this was under those same names, basically, that I came up to, up against with the, um, uh, with, in, in, in the chocolate industry. Nestle again, Unilever, Tata, all of these uh, people. And even now, this was almost 10 years after it was first discovered, UNICEF, which is the lead UN agency in this, is only in a handful of more than a thousand tea estates in the Northeast. They are not allowed to go and monitor other tea estates. This is a trade, an industry, that makes $20 billion a year plus. In India, it makes $3 billion a year. Yet it has no, what do you call it, um, help fund for those tea estates that go under for businesses in trouble, to educate the workers, nothing. So that was from 2000 until now. So my narrative, or the point I want to bring to this, and I think when Candy said that at the 2000 Millennium Goals, there were no private sector people involved, which to me sounds absolutely bonkers. But they're still not involved, and they're still not actually addressing the issue. And the real issue here is, I think as Nathaniel said, you have to create the wealth. But then you have to share the wealth fairly, and you have to share that through strong institutions. The people at the bottom of the chain and right through up have to know that the system will deliver for them. Because if they don't know that, you either keep them completely repressed and starving and immobile, or you raise it up to such a level that we've seen in the Arab Spring where they suddenly overturn the corrupt rulers. And that doesn't work either because that doesn't bring a panoply of strong institutions floating down from heaven. So I think that, that, the, that the key issue here, there might be 17 goals, and I've got to tell you, before I walked into this room, I didn't know there were 17 and I haven't got the faintest idea what they are. <laughs> but I do know that our industrialized revolution that created the wealth and security that we've got here was not created by globalized 17 goals. Nor was China's wealth that has bought people up that are now owning Ferraris and buying their flats. That didn't rely on that. What it relies on is money goes where money feels safe. Money feels safe when it, develop, when it produces uh, wealth. The wealth needs to be shared. When you have enough strong institutions, and people like Nestle and Hershey have strong institutions within their companies, but they refused to share that, but exploited the corrupt institutions of the new democracies. When you have those uh, institutions, the money is going in, the rule of law will be written, and the strong institutions will be created, because the money will need to have the rule of law to make it safe. That's how China came into being. That's how Europe and America came into being. And that is how 
Africa is really jumping at the moment, really jumping. And I'll just finish by this, the worst offender in all this, and the one that gets away with it too much is India. The 21 million abused slaves and uh, workers around the world, India has by far the most of them. It doesn't implement its laws properly, and I'm gonna finish on a most depressing story. I do apologize for this. We hear about the rape case in India recently. When I was doing something on brick kilns about a year ago, in the middle of Orissa, uh, we went to people that had been rescued from this. It takes two years to take somebody who's been abused like that and make them again into a human being. Make them to understand emotions, to have hope. And one of the weapons that's used with impunity by the labor contractors and the various businessmen is you take a family and then you take the woman of the family and you rape that woman in front of the husband and the children. And once that's done, you have a workforce that is compliant. And quite how these multinationals know this and do nothing about it, and until that is broken, people like Nathaniel there are gonna come up against these vested interests and they're gonna try and destroy him. And I think we should back what he's doing, what everybody else is doing. I hope that doesn't happen. Thank you.